American original. The Bitcoin group. The American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. We'd like to welcome our panelists, Christoph Atlas from Anonymous Bitcoin Book. Excited to be here. Thank you. And Megan Lords from Bitcoin, not bombs. Thanks for having me. Issue one. Bitcoin price drops after Chinese bank rumors. It's deja vu all over again as last week's top story. As last week's top story is this week's top story, but this time with a punch. The rumors that knocked Bitcoin down to 590 last week have knocked it down to 500 and now may be confirmed. Will China ban banks from working with Bitcoin exchanges? Is the rumor true? How low will we go? Christoph Atlas. Um, I mentioned this uh, one or two episodes ago, but I think there's something uh, funny going on with Bitcoin and journalism right now. So a journalist who comes up with a fake story about Bitcoin, um, especially if it's a negative story, that can either, um, it's going to give them a lot of positive attention because people want to hear negative stories about Bitcoin. They want to see it get chopped down. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of haters out there. And when, if, if and when they're exposed to come up with a fake story later on, I'm not sure that they suffer the same kind of consequences that they would, they would suffer if they lied about another kind of story that wasn't Bitcoin related. So I don't know if this uh, story is accurate or not, but, but really all we have to go on right now is the word of this one journalist who you know maintains that it's a, a true story. And I am concerned about the uh, incentives that are there for journalism. Just the other day I went on this, uh, followed this one link to, it was more of a, um, uh, not a mainstream media kind of website, but it, it was a site that called itself a news website. And the guy said, um, oh yeah, and this was back in December, uh, according to the latest Snowden leaks, uh, the, the NSA can hack Bitcoin. It can uh, make up Bitcoins as much as they want to and so forth. And he misunderstood uh, the material that was released by Edward Snowden and the journalists he's working with. And then there was no redaction, and I tweeted at him, and I said, hey, are you going to, where's the correction on this? You're a news website. You claim to be a, a news website. You claim to be a journalist. You were wrong about this. Why haven't you posted an update to the, the story? And he just ignored my claims, and he said, oh, what are you saying? You know, Bitcoin is just unhackable. You know, it just not what I was saying. So I think there are some perverse incentives uh, for non-Bitcoin journalists when they're talking about Bitcoin, and, and that makes me concerned whenever there's these kind of a bad, a bad news story. So we'll wait and see what happens with this one, but in general, when I see a story that has kind of weak news, my first uh, incentive right now is going to be to ignore it. I do agree, Christoph, with, with Bitcoin always dying. It's really easy to write these journalist headlines that come out and Bitcoin is dying because of blank. So they just keep writing more in this series of Bitcoin is dying, not realizing how embarrassing it looks for them. They keep yeah. confirming that the patient is dead and the patient keeps coming back to life. Yeah, I imagine if you, were, you said this about a person and you never uh, corrected it later on to say, oh shit, I was wrong, the guy is completely alive. We just saw him, you know, if 20 people just saw him at Starbucks, he's perfectly fine. Uh, that would be a big mistake for a journalist, but when they talk about a, a cryptocurrency, then for some reason those rules go out the window. For a person or a country, you'd think they'd report on this kind of thing. They've, they've banned you. They've broken your encryption. That's pretty serious news against someone or a, or a country. And yet yeah, with Bitcoin, they don't even publish a retraction. That's crazy. Right, yeah. Imagine the, the Brazilian currency gets reported as going under, and they're just like, oh, well, I guess, whatever. Uh, I guess it did turn out not to be true. Sure, um, last week, Brazil's currency didn't collapse. Oops, <laughs> just move on. Right. Who cares? right, right. Megan, your thoughts? So there are no apologies for bad journalism these days, but there are also no standards for journalism anymore. And this is a serious issue, um, especially as someone who's a writer who likes to report on what's actually happening in the world. You see so many bad stories 
crap stories that you know that are just rumors and they report it as if it's news when it's really rumors so I'm definitely I definitely agree with Kristoff here I'm not really going to believe it until you know we see some actual journalism taking place here it really seems like it's dying out the standards have gotten so abysmally low it's very difficult uh, for me to read uh, all types of news sources news sources now it's not just in mainstream sources anymore this has really become widespread and I don't know if it's it's just a matter of laziness on the part of journalists and reporters or on the parts of the readers for not really holding them accountable. Like, like you all were saying, if this was a person, they would be coming out, you know, and saying, no, this is, you know, wrong and at least apologizing. But you don't see that happening at all with Bitcoin. I think these are rumors, um, but the bad part of it is rumors very much affect the price of Bitcoin. So whenever you have these unsubstantiated rumors coming out, it's making the price even more wildly fluctuate. And that hurts it as a currency. That makes it look very unstable for people who would otherwise invest in it. And it makes it, uh, you know, I'd like to see some stability. At the same time, I, how low will it go? I, I'm not sure. I would like to see it maybe go a little bit lower. I'm super broke at the moment. I would like to be buying, but I'm not, uh, obviously. But uh, I, I do hope it goes a little bit lower and maybe stabilize, stabilizes for a while. But at the moment, these are all just rumors, and I think the Bitcoin community is very selective about their news, and they're very careful um, about the, the journalists that they read and about the information that they're taking in. And we have to apply those standards, uh, you know, at least at least for ourselves. So, you know, we shouldn't be the ones getting all worked up about it. We can let other people who may not be as educated about the topic, you know, they can get worked up about it. They can, you know, freak out, oh, Bitcoin's dead, oh, Bitcoin's alive, you know, whatever it's doing. But, uh, you know, we need to keep our standards high uh, when we're doing the reporting because that's going to be the only way to counteract a lot of this really sloppy journalism that we're seeing. I wouldn't hold out any hope for those apologies. I'm not even sure that Newsweek has apologized to Satoshi Nakamoto. Right. And finally, it could be worse. The, the journalists could be speculating on Bitcoin as the price is going down, knowing that they're writing a bad story, or the news agency themselves. There's so much money on the table, and clearly Bitcoin prices are affected by the news. It's only a matter of time before somebody goes after that money with uh, some speculation like this. Exit question. What's the price this time next week? Kristoff. Um, I think it depends on what we see, you know, how this story pans out. If um, there's continu you know, continuation of no evidence to support it, then I expect the price to go up a bit. Uh, if there is evidence to support it, will go down. Obviously, um, investment in China is a big thing that's been fueling uh, the price of Bitcoin over the last few months. In the long term, I don't think it will make a, a huge difference, but um, certainly in the next uh, you know, 6 to 12 months or whatever, the degree of investment in China is going to make a big impact. Megan. If I could predict what Bitcoin was going to be next week, then I'd be a Bitcoin millionaire by now. So I, I'm really bad at these predictions. I really think it because it's so sensitive to the news events that are going on in the world, there's going to be some fluctuation. So I really couldn't put a number on it. It all depends on what happens next. I hate to continue being wrong, but I'll go bullish with 650. And I just want to remind everyone at home that What's important about Bitcoin is how much money the venture capitalists have invested into companies to support this thing. That money is still all sitting out there. All of those companies are still working even when the price goes down. They're still building new tools and new technologies that will help Bitcoin in the future. And the price will probably follow those new tools and technologies. Issue two, IRS, Bitcoin is not a currency. The Internal Revenue Service has labeled Bitcoin a commodity and declared that Bitcoin falls under capital gains taxes around 30% rather than foreign currency taxes around 50%. This is good news because it's clarification, but bad news because it may mean you'd have to report capital gains taxes on every Bitcoin purchase you make, nullifying its usefulness as a currency. What will happen? Will the IRS decision stand? Will it kill Bitcoin? Megan Lords. It will not kill Bitcoin. I think they are doing this uh, to 
uh, they, they see money that they sh think should be theirs and obviously Bitcoin has been very popular and they're trying to just I, I think they've kind of probably rushed these uh, tax laws out just to have something right before tax season to kind of scare people and shake people up but I really see it as g pretty difficult to enforce the amount of paperwork that's going to be involved is going to discourage a lot of people from reporting and I think you're going to see a lot of people not reporting for ideological reasons um, of, of course you are going to see people who are going to try to play by the rules and, and pay their taxes and I think you're going to find them get very frustrated with all of the paperwork that's involved in this and I think I would like to see the IRS back off I don't think they're going to though that's not in the nature of government that's not in the nature of the IRS whatsoever uh, it's interesting that they made it a you know they classified it as an asset and not a currency obviously they're smart enough at least to see what that would do if they legitimize it as a currency but I think we all know that it is a currency uh, we obviously use it as that uh, thousands of people do every day for transactions we've legitimized it through our usage so I don't think they're gonna back down but I think that they still lack the understanding of it and I think it's gonna be really difficult to enforce it's I I also think it's a good opportunity for uh, some resistance to some of these tax laws uh, many of us, you know, we were born after the income tax was instated and we feel uh, kind of trapped by that. We have regular non agorous jobs and it's something I don't think anyone wants to be in a cage. I pay my taxes because I don't want to be caged. It's more worth it to just pay their bribe and go on with my life. But with my Bitcoin, I don't know that, that's, that I'm going to go by those same rules and I think a lot of people uh, that are into Bitcoin tend to be younger. They tend to have more of a mind to resist these things so I'd like to see uh, some some heavy resistance to these ridiculous tax laws it's a little reminiscent of the decision to go after Napster you had the kids participating in this brand new ecosystem of music and you decide to kind of stomp on it the rules on capital gains taxes have the ability to turn a whole generation off to taxes in the way that the Napster decision turned a whole generation off to the law I mean, yes. you have this situation like Absolutely. no one's going to be able like, even if you wanted to do your best, if you bought a book today at Amazon, you'd have to pay a different tax rate than if you bought the book yesterday at Amazon. The price of Bitcoin is always moving. It clearly seems to be a currency, and yet they insist on going through this whole temporary commodity phase. Christoph? I think that the the ruling is pretty much what I expected uh, to come from the IRS. I fully expected that they were going to force us to pay capital gains taxes. Um, I know that people are kind of worried about the paperwork that, that will be incurred, but I, I'm not too concerned about it. I think it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, if you have records of... I mean, it's, it's, it, if you have just a Bitcoin address, if you know, if you have records of when you obtained a Bitcoin uh, at which address you, you obtained it, it's going to be relatively straightforward to have software that looks at the blockchain, pulls down the time that the transactions took place, uh, looks at the fair market value, calculates the, ca the capital gains for you. I, I don't think that's going to be terrible, di terribly difficult. We're just going to need a new you know, turbo tax for Bitcoin or whatever for those people that do want to report their capital gains income on Bitcoin. Um, I'm certainly planning on on reporting all of my income related to Bitcoin, especially since I am a uh, you know a prominent figure in the area of financial privacy, um, I do think that uh, there will be some people that won't want to pay taxes on their Bitcoin, and what it will take for that to happen is we're going to need some ideologically driven software developers, people who are hardcore libertarians or anarchists or, or whatever who really believe in financial privacy, who really uh, believe in the ability to uh, evade taxes. Um, and those are the people that are going to provide the software uh, to people that uh, want to not pay taxes on their cryptocurrency holdings. So that's absolutely something that's going to happen. Um, I don't think it's going to come out of the sort of the mainline Bitcoin developers so much. I don't see that kind of ideological drive in any of the core developers that I'm aware of. Um, even in the case of, of Darkcoin, the main developer for that coin, his uh, political comments are pretty tempered. 
I don't know if that's for legal reasons or what, but I, I do think that it's going to take some de software developers that are really um, passionate about this kind of stuff that are going to put the time in and make it a priority to push this software out. So we're just going to have to kind of wait for that and, and see how it goes. There definitely seems to be a shift going on into the community where the older libertarian members of Bitcoin seem to be being pushed out by the newer, richer corporate members who have a different view of what Bitcoin should be and don't seem to think that they need the libertarians anymore, so they're trying to get rid of them. So. Right. And I do wonder about the potential for people to be made examples of, especially if you are highly prominent in Bitcoin and you're coming out as a tax resistor. Uh, that's always a danger, and that's something that we have to expect. Exit question. Will the IRS stick with their decision, or will Congress get involved? Does this ruling stand? Megan Lords. Hmm. I think it's going to likely stand. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Sure. Christoph Atlas. The only possible, uh, th there's a very limited set, set of scenarios where politicians uh, try to make things more convenient for Bitcoin because a Bitcoin is fundamentally antithetical to uh, their best interests. Um, you know, the, the ways that that could happen, there could be um, some powerful lobbyists in the Bitcoin community that bribe them. Uh, that might be something that could happen, although I'm, I'm skeptical about that, that scenario. Uh, but that they're, certainly they're not going to do it out of the goodness of their heart. They're not going to do it to uh, create jobs or, you know, stimulate the economy or any of that stuff. Uh, because Bitcoin takes power out of their hands. Um, I do think that if they were to take some kind of decision like that, uh, Bitcoin could do amazing things for economies all over the world. But politicians are fundamentally not concerned about how the economy is doing. They're concerned about tax revenue and uh, who who happens to be office at the time. So uh, I think that the, you know this if this. Uh, if the Bitcoin laws change with respect to the IRS, they're only going to get worse from here and drive people deeper into the, the underground markets. There is a possibility that Congress could put a stay on the current law because the capital gains on purchasing could be so complicated and onerous. Uh, but the long term, I think they will have to change it to a currency eventually, but it's going to be longer term. Issue three. Two exchanges fall, one exchange ascends. Vicarex and Crypto Rush are no more. One due to large withdrawals, one due to errors, but both former Bitcoin exchanges. Meanwhile, at Kraken, they've cryptographically proven their reserves. What's the future for exchanges? Compliance and cryptographically proven reserves like Kraken? Or loss, bankruptcy, and failure? like Vicorex and Crypto Rush. Christoph Atlas. Well, I think clearly uh, exchanges like Kraken are setting the standard for the other exchanges. So more and more we're going to see this form of positive self-regulation. Um, you know, proof of reserves is a, an absolutely wonderful thing. We'll see more auditing like Coinbase has set the standard for. We will see uh, things like voting pools. Uh, all of these, these cryptographic technologies that help uh, secure customer funds and reduce liability for the exchanges. Whether they would become more compliant with government laws or not, uh, it's not clear to me. Um, I think that I think exchanges over time will be driven towards the tax jurisdictions that have the most friendly regulation and the ones that uh, are that currently exist uh, in heavily regulated areas. Um, they're either going to have to move or they're going to go out of business. So you know, I, I'll call it right now. I don't really see there being any exchanges in New York City five years from now, uh, aside perhaps from those exchanges that tailor exclusively to a very large scale investors. But you know, in terms of the average person, I don't think they're going to be using any even a single exchange that's based out of out of New York. Um, due to the, the regulation. And the regulators there are, are some of the worst and they're just absolutely not going to back down on this stuff. Um, so that's what I see happening with exchanges. And I, I think that Kraken is a wonderful development. I'm excited that they have uh, made these changes so quickly 
and the rate of improvement on the, the securing, uh, securing customer funds and just innovating is just really, really impressive. Megan Lords. I think the exchanges that are going to shut down are going to be the ones that aren't competitive enough and aren't doing the things that Kraken did. They're not cryptographically proving their reserves. I think that's setting the standard and I think that you're going to see uh, a lot more self-regulation because that's going to uh, and I, th I think you have to see that because that's the alternative to government regulation because you can't, I mean, if people are losing money on an exchange, it's going to upset them. Not everyone in Bitcoin is a libertarian or anarchist. They're going to run to the state for help and they're going to say, well, we need to crack down on these Bitcoin exchanges. And I, I definitely agree with what Christoph said. I don't think you're going to see any in uh, New York um, or any of the other states where, where finances are highly regulated. Uh, but I would like to see more self-regulation. I think that's the natural direction things are going, and I think that's very good news, and I think it's going to be reflective of the community as a whole um, in a lot of other aspects. So I, I'm excited to see that, and I think that obviously uh, we, we, have the you know, we have the means to do that with these exchanges to, to prove the reserves, and that's going to become the norm. I agree, Megan, and self-regulation is really the only way to restore trust after the failures of Crypto Rush and Vicarex. If people are going to trust these exchanges, they're going to have to prove their reserves and be much more public about what they do. We're joined by Derek J. Freeman from Peace News Now. Derek, we were just discussing exchanges Vicarex and Crypto Rush, which went down, and Kraken, which is now cryptographically proven. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's terrific to see examples like Kraken, or Kraken, however it's pronounced, approving full uh, reserves. Cryptographically, this is the future that I want to see, and I'm glad to see someone step up and show us how it's done. Uh, in the future, this is what companies will emulate. We're also joined by Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Will, what are your thoughts on the new exchanges? Yeah, I think it's a great model, like Derek pointed out, to you know show this willful self-regulation, so to speak. Um, there were, I know, times when Andreas did some third-party audits for um, Coinbase and maybe maybe someone else as well. But that kind of um, that kind of uh, self-regulation is really important. You never are going to see that from you know the banking houses and investment houses. Uh, central banks certainly not full, comprehensive, transparent self-auditing that can be trusted and cryptographically proven. You're never going to see that. So to see it here for the first time in this new model is really fantastic and bodes well for the future. Like Derek said, um, if you know, it's kind of going to become, I think, what's preferred by the community. I mean, so so and so's exchange may be very well funded uh, from a like you know VC backing and stuff like that, but and well and good names running the exchange, good management. But if they're not willing to go the full extent in terms of uh, proving reserves or you know just um, being fully transparent, they might have less of a um, competitive edge in the market. You know, for not going that full, you know, the full extent. So to see this from some leaders in the space, obviously, you know. Uh, Kraken, a U.S.-based exchange, not currently operating in the U.S., but um, certainly one of the higher volume exchanges, uh, kind of taking taking uh, the high road in a lot of these regulatory um, things. With you know, they're they're very there's a lot of oversight o over them. They're very compliant. That's why they're no operate in the U.S. But they're they're very uh, attuned to the community as well, and they're trying to um, you know show that they're listening to the community and what the community wants, and I really appreciate that. It was great to see a Coinbase independently audited by Andreas Antonopoulos. As uh, many of you know at home, Mt. Gox was never, ever independently audited. Exit question. Will we ever have another situation where an exchange is run by a single person like Mt. Gox? Derek J. Yeah, of, of course. I, I think we're going to see that. Uh, it, it's only 2014. Uh, obviously, in the future, people are going to learn and say, oh, uh, we, we need to have a, a balance of power here. But right now, we're used to the old model. At, at least I am. You know, if I see a, a company 
um, you know, I, I want a dictator, dictatorial leader, you know, who can really get things done in, within the company. You know, uh, decentralized models are probably going to be more popular in the future as technology improves and helps us uh, use that. But right now, sort of uh, authoritarian uh, companies work well. <laughs> so I think we'll see more of uh, the Mark Carpelli's uh, doxings in, in the future. But uh, it's going to change. Christoph, Atlas. Yeah, I don't think this is something that's going to uh, change across the board immediately. Uh, we will still uh, continue to see uh, some of these, you know, short-term failures, but uh, they'll fall by the wayside more and more as time goes on. Megan, Lords. It is what we're used to. We're used to giving one guy control of everything uh, and have it kind of a top-down structure. So I think over time you'll see that decreasing, but in the long term uh, it's very easy for an individual to dupe a lot of people into making them think that they're trustworthy. So I think you're going to see that probably a few more times and hopefully decreasing in the long term. Will Pangman. Yeah, um, you're going to continue to see it until some of the next generation protocols and decentralized exchanges hit the market. Um, once, once there's like proof of concept with some of those, um, exchanges run in the, in the responsible fashion that some are being run today, and of course also the irresponsible fashion as we've seen from some, namely most notably probably Mt. Gox. Um, we'll continue to see exchanges and businesses run that way uh, and so whether on the black market or on the up and up, um, yeah, there will be, you know, central authorities in that respect until I think we, we get to the paradigm shift of, um, of decentralized exchange as an application on, you know, in the cryptocurrency space as a whole, which I think will quickly change the landscape and um, hopefully, you know, the, the most nimble of these companies will be able to uh, pivot onto that type of... Um, an implementation and their companies will survive and and that'll be advantage for them you know to decentralize in that way so it'll be interesting to see uh, whereas in the last century or maybe even few centuries centralization um, being kind of a galvanizer for um, for the company's bottom line uh, whereas in the future perhaps decentralization will be the galvanizer for a company's bottom line it's really it'll be really interesting to see I agree I, 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 I hope sorry go ahead Christoph Sorry, I wanted to mention the uh, will mention the black market, and I covered this the other day on uh, uh, Dark News on the World Crypto Network. Um, Silk Road 2.0, they were hacked a little while ago before Mt. Gox related to the transactional transaction ma malleability stuff. And the first thing that the admin had to say about this is, um, "Look, we're not going to do de uh, centralized escrows anymore. Uh, we're we're shutting down the escrow until we can get a true uh, decentralized." Uh, you know, multi-signature kind of escrow going. And so it's really interesting to see that the black market, who you would think would have the least incentive to uh, be innovative and to stand by their customers, would uh, would do that. But they, you know, that, that, that was exactly the case in the Silk Road 2.0. And not only did they do that, but they're also allegedly paying back all of the lost customer funds with their own, you know, pocket money. And so um, it's, I'm really curious to see if the black market uh, areas are going to continue to be the leaders in this regard, and I'm interested to see what that says about the, the white market players. I was very impressed to hear that Silk Road 2.0 is paying back its uh, users, according to reports. And uh, as for the uh, having one person in charge of an exchange, I'd like to believe that we've grown out of that, but I think we're all kind of forgetting the computer whiz kid theory. If there's a whiz kid out there that can write his own decentralized exchange, he's probably going to be in charge of it. He's probably going to be the only one with the keys and the programming and everything. So I don't know if we'll see another one of those. I don't know if Carpellis was one of those or if he just got into a good situation. But decentralized exchanges run by one person, I suppose it's going to happen again. Issue four, grab bag. Which is the most exciting development for Bitcoin? Walmart accepts gift. You can now convert your Bitcoins into gift cards with GYFT.com that you can use at Walmart, Target, Whole Foods, or Amazon.com. Or World Water Day accepts Bitcoin. Community-funded project to bring water wells to Africa accepts Bitcoin. 
Donate today at thewaterproject.org. Meanwhile, I was going to mention Dodge, Doge, but they just donated $15,000 for World Water Day. But what I was going to talk about is founder of Moolah, sponsors Doge, NASCAR, because of typo. A $2 million Doge, a $2 million Doge donation quickly became a 20 million Doge donation, thanks to one more zero. And now Doge has their own NASCAR. Is there anything Doge can't do? Derek J. Well, first of all, I have to say how surprised I am that the, the CEO and founder of the payment processing company would make a typo error when sending a payment. Uh, but it's... Interesting also to see his take on that was not, uh, oh, I made this mistake, uh, please can I have my money back? Instead it was, who's going to match this donation and uh, step up to the plate, you know? It was, uh, it was a nice attitude, and the Doge community has, has shown this uh, donation and Doge. They're, they go hand in hand. That seems to be the, the number one use. Bitcoin as well, but okay. What's the most exciting news? The water thing, man. Come on, uh, you can get. This is what Bitcoin is. That's the most exciting part of it for me. You know, I when I heard about Bitcoin, I knew this was going to change the world because we can send micro payments to other parts of the country. People who are in need are going to get that the need uh, the the help that they need from independent people like you and me, and we can send a donation to help someone drink clean water. I mean. It doesn't get more fundamental than that. And I like that the website even gives you the option to go from one person all the way up to a school. It really gives you a nice scale to see, like, you know, how many people you can impact. You, just yourself. Very cool. Christoph, Atlas. I'm going to go with the, uh, the water story as well. And what excites me about it is um, I like to see uh, Bitcoin uh, charities taking place. Uh, both because you know they're they're helping people, and because they put out a positive message about Bitcoin. But also, I think that the way that we convert the world to Bitcoin is to touch as many people with Bitcoin as possible. Whether that's giving them a small amount of Bitcoin to get them started with their first wallet, or uh, whether it's people in Africa that um, they're going to have a major change to their lives, and I suspect that they'll be, they'll be aware that Bitcoin was involved with this positive impact on their lives. Uh, so I think, you know, by whatever means uh, that we can make it happen, the more people that we touch with Bitcoin, the better uh, it is for the world as more and more people become friendly to it. Megan Lords. I don't know. I'm pretty excited that I can buy stuff at Walmart with Bitcoin. No, not at all. Like the water thing, obviously, is the biggest story in this. And that's why, that's the whole reason I'm in Bitcoin, is the charitable aspects of it, that, it, that you can show solidarity with your fellow man no matter where he or she is in the world. And that's really what's going to bring people on board, and that's really what I'd like to see highlighted more. You don't always see that highlight. I mean, of course, I'm always blabbering about it, but you really don't see, uh, at least a lot of the people that I've talked to that heard of Bitcoin or know maybe a little bit about it, they don't know its potential for charity and helping other people, and that's so important. And I really love the Dogecoin community's attitude towards charity, too. They seem to have that at the forefront of Dogecoin, whereas with Bitcoin, you kind of see it, you know, tucked into a corner, like, you know, maybe you can have a charity panel here sometimes, but uh, we're going to be talking about, like, regulation and, like, the tech aspect, and, you know, maybe your panel's going to get cut or something like that. I mean, there's there's kind of like a you shoving charity into the corner uh, unless it's convenient uh, to kind of bring out to the forefront. But with Dogecoin, you're kind of seeing that at the forefront. And I think it is interesting that they're... They have a NASCAR card. That's uh, that's an interesting approach. But I think, uh, especially what Derek said, uh, when the guy made that mistake of sending 20 million Dogecoin, he was just like, "Oh well, like you guys matched this. Come on, like throw in your Dogecoin." So I think that's great, and I think that's the attitude that I'd like to see more of in the Bitcoin space. So if we could kind of like marry those kind of, you know, the enthusiasm, the attitude of the Dogecoin community with the Bitcoin community, I'd like to see some working together. And let's let's help people who are really struggling. Let's help people who are, are suffering and who could benefit so much from our help. And, let, and let's do it in a, in a 
you know, through currency too. Not everyone has the skills to be or even the ability to be able to travel to other countries and actually physically help these people and help them build structures that they need or help them get water that they need. A lot of people go to these other countries and they don't have training in construction and background and some of these things that you really need to actually be on the ground helping these people. So leave it up to specialization. Leave it up to people who know how to do that and put the financial backing behind them. It's so easy to do too. Um, that I think it's going to be very uh, easy to get people on board with in general. So I, I am so excited about the charity aspect of it. That that to me is the biggest thing in Bitcoin pretty much, period. Will Pangman. Yeah, I, I will agree with everyone that the coolest story out of those uh, is probably the water one, but I want to spend more time talking about uh, the Dogecoin guys. And just to pick up really where Megan left off, um, you know, Bitcoin has always had, since it became even somewhat newsworthy, has always had a PR problem. Um, and there isn't much out there trying to clean that up and there are those who are doing a very good job with um, you know some PR outreach in some smaller areas or certain niches and um, or among certain you know professional circles maybe but plenty of plenty of work still to go uh, of course you know the, the headlines are still kind of atrocious uh, they're getting better I gotta say I've been noticing a lot more um, aptitude in, as far as understanding goes among most of the press out there reporting on it, but of course it's still a problem. And Dogecoin has seemed to address this head on and uh, they get the charity side of it, as Megan pointed out. The, the NASCAR thing is a brilliant marketing play, a brilliant move. Um, and whether or not the extra zero uh, as part of that donation is legit or you know just another crafty you know PR strategy, um, is beside the point. The fact is, they're, they're, they're sending Jamaican bobsled team to Sochi for the Olympics. They're wrapping a NASCAR in Dogecoin insignias. And, I mean, the amount of awareness that that raises is huge. How many people um, outside of the typical IT, security, computer, tech-savvy crowds slash libertarian crowds are going to come to Bitcoin in this next wave of adoption uh, by way of Dogecoin first, you know, because of the great work that they're doing. That's happening with a lot of people, and the tip bots are indi uh, indications of that. And the fact that charity, charitable giving is so plentiful in that community and such a top priority in that community, I think there's a lot of lessons that um, growing Bitcoin businesses can learn uh, you know, aside from the, like, let's say the big dozen or the big ten or whatever Bitcoin businesses out there, there's some really, there's some, they've ignored marketing pretty much, you know. Uh, they've ignored some, you know, the regular menu of things you do for advertising and brand awareness and stuff. Um, and uh, even some of the big, big guys aren't really out and about doing a whole heavy bunch of marketing. A lot of their budgets are tied up with regulatory compliance these days or with other you know development research and development issues or just not on their radar um, but these types of people seem to be uh, helping grow the Dogecoin community and I think Bitcoin can learn some lessons from that as, as Megan pointed out um, it's really exciting to see the, what can Doge what what can Dogecoin do? What can't Dogecoin do? I don't know. It's pretty fantastic to see for this from a joke currency that's continuously inflating you know it's it's I've heard awesome. the, uh, the Doge NASCAR is very Zoom and much fast. <laughs> Moving on to questions and answers. Your questions are answers. Justin Cohen writes, how many months slash years do you guys think the IRS ruling has set back mainstream adoption? Loaded question. None. Derek? None, Will? Derek? Yeah, I'd say zero. Christoph? I, I can't imagine that anyone expected something completely different, so I don't think it's going to make a difference. Megan? I pretty much concur with that. I don't think it's going to make a difference. Yeah, yeah we're all in we're agreement. We're everyone thought that they were going to have to pay capital gains taxes on this anyway. I think most people were planning to um, just in advance, even before the decision. Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of reason to think that uh, this is a 
you know, the fact that there's an answer, period, is a, is a plus, right? That's, that's it's clarity, and that's a plus. Pl clarity helps. Whether it's, you know, poorly, poorly designed or not is kind of beside the issue that there's an answer. That's great. The other thing is, you know, I've heard lots of people who would fall into the kind of philosophical camp that we share here as panelists on this show, I might argue, and they also have, like, a lot of skin in the game, and they see this as an advantage, just... Um, you know, I'm not aware of the particular loopholes, but uh, cl being classified as property, there's a, you know, if you're treating Bitcoin as an investment, even if you're using it as a means of exchange, you can essentially, there are loopholes out there, I'm hearing, to kick the can down the road, so to speak, with your property taxes on these assets. And, um, you know, through some methods, um, you know, I don't know tax law very much at all, but I've heard and read some things in recent days about this, that um, I think people will find some of these loopholes and, and uh, for, for lack of a better term, allow actually the common man for a change to exploit them as opposed to just the uber rich. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is, a, is an incredibly scarce uh, digital asset that anyone can possess. It's not just exclusive to the uber rich who have access to incredibly special privileges um, at high levels of banking so, or high levels of finance. So now everyone can have access to these things, and and soon through the open source nature of this net of this community and the sharing that goes on, uh, I'm sure we'll all become hip to some of these really interesting things that have been available to billionaires that are now potentially available to to the small Bitcoin user. I think that the the, the interpretations of the law are going to get weird too, because let's say you you get some you acquire some Bitcoin and you have a multi-sig address where you have half of the key and your friend has half of the key. Who owns the bitcoins at that point? Um, there's gonna it's as the as the currency stuff gets more complicated and more sophisticated, the legal the attempts to legally interpret this stuff are just going to get I think incredibly uh, convoluted and uh, they may fall way behind the technology. And the real issue here is that the government is acknowledging that Bitcoin exists. This is the first step towards currency. Our next question also from Justin Cohen. I'm in Australia. In Australia, however, many countries look to the U.S. for their own guidance, and the U.S. can apply political pressure on other countries to follow their lead. Will the U.S. decision lead to other countries adopting similar tax decisions? I yeah. certainly hope so. I mean, you know, not that I'm in favor of these kinds of decrees by fiat, but I do appreciate the clarity, and I think they got it, you know, they may not have meant to get it right, you know, I see, like, the potential for this interesting game to be played where you can't be compliant under FinCEN and the IRS at the same time, and they're both agencies out of the Treasury. So that's an interesting game that might be going on. But bottom line, mm. it, they might have gotten right one thing, and that is that Bitcoin truly is property. You know, you actually have private property when you possess those private keys and you maintain good security over them. And so... I kind of hope more jurisdictions, rather than having a contentious stance or an unknown stance, um, can have, you know, again, as you mentioned, Thomas, maybe this is the first step, having this kind of a stance, hopefully classifying it in some way around this property concept, uh, which I think is the right direction to go. Derek. It's going to have an impact on the countries considered within the Anglo-American Empire. Uh, you know, Australia, the UK, they will follow the leadership of the United States. But uh, I don't think it's going to have the same impact in other countries that, say, want to compete with the Anglo-American Empire. They may have different rules for Bitcoin. Christoph? Uh, yeah, definitely the United States has uh, exhibited... Uh, tremendous power in terms of pressuring other countries to adopt uh, laws when they want to. It's worked well in uh, Sweden and you know all, all over the globe. Um, so I, I definitely expect that there will be other countries that will follow suit. Megan? 
Yes, I think you're going to see a homogenous approach to these kind of Anglo uh, countries kind of falling in line, uh, following behind the U.S., but there are a lot of other countries who desperately need Bitcoin due to uh, the currency, for the much more serious currency problems they're facing. And I think you're seeing a, a lot of these countries are wanting to be more competitive with the U.S. They're wanting to gain more of a foothold in these world markets. So I think you may see uh, less regulations or maybe even no regulations uh, because they recognize the potential Bitcoin has and how having these lower regulations or no regulations, uh, maybe in some cases, they can bring you know entrepreneurs and people into their countries and, and boost their own economies and make themselves larger players in, in the world markets. I agree, Megan. There may be a chance for other countries to differentiate themselves by choosing different laws. Is Switzerland going to be the Switzerland of Bitcoins? Next question from Daniel Richardson. Bitcoin, finally some negative views on Bitcoin here. Bitcoin as a currency, in my opinion, is doomed. The protocol and the blockchain are really good at this app, but I believe smart contracts, wills, etc., will allow us to prove our assets and wealth to people without needing a monetary system at all. Why have money? Interesting opinion. I hear this a lot from the, I guess, the, the anarcho-left types of folks about, you know, trying to stop thinking about money altogether, like abdicating themselves or, you know, absolving the human, human race from the use of money because it's always seen as evil traditionally by the, you know, that set. And I kind of don't think that, you know, something inanimate can be evil. Um, again, I think we've seen that the rules behind it make all the difference. So if you have a usurious uh, financial system, that's pretty evil because the rules are u u usurious, right? And predatory, of course, by, by nature. And they disrupt uh, equilibrium because there's a false scarcity going on and there's control from top down. With Bitcoin, you can basically just take the opposite of all of those features and that's what you have, essentially, is this really naked opposite thing to that, which is, again, maybe more capitalistic, for lack of a better term, at least traditionally speaking, which is not something that anyone should, should push anyone away. I'm eager to hear what the rest of the panel has to say about this because I know we're all in relatively the same camp from that kind of perspective, but I want everyone to use Bitcoin. I want the biggest statists to use it. I want the farthest left uh, anarchists to use it, and everyone in between, everywhere, right? It's it's open for a reason, and um, I don't think that seeing it as a token or a currency, to answer the question, to say it's doomed is pretty strong. The, the person asking the question may be right that, um, yeah, the protocol lives on, and we see things more widely adopted in Metacoins or whatever, non-Bitcoin or things riding on the rails of Bitcoin. Uh, which would be which would be great in my opinion too. So um, yeah, I don't think we should be so quick to divorce ourselves from the concept of money. Just the concept of usurious, predatory uh, rules behind the money and those things being coming from top down. Derek J. Man, I hope this guy's right. That would be a really cool future to live in, where you know everything's so efficient and can be proven, and we don't need money. I think that would be great. Uh, I I have no allegiance or special uh, you know need or love of, of money. I just find it useful and you know as long as it's useful I'm gonna keep using it. I like Bitcoin because it's more useful money than stuff I've used in the past but hey if we come to this future that this guy's imagining I'm all for it. I don't need Bitcoin. I just need an easy way to transact with my fellow human beings. Christoph Atlas. Well I think that money is an incredibly useful tool um, and uh, certainly I prefer to use money uh, I think there are sound economic re reasons for it. But the great thing about Bitcoin is that it is 100% opt-in. If you do not wish to use Bitcoin, you don't have to. No one's ever going to make you use Bitcoin. So if you want to live in an area or a particular society where they do not use currencies and everything works off of some kind of uh, smart contract system, then, uh, you know, be all... Be my guest, you know, go for it. I think that's fantastic. Love to see people trying out and experimenting with different things. I personally don't want to join into the experiment, but uh, as long as you allow me to use Bitcoin in my own space, then I have no objection. Megan Lords. 
I think there's a lot of room in the future for competing and cooperating economic systems. So I've, it sounds like this person may be supportive of an idea of a resource-based economy, uh, which I've seen coming from uh, the anarchists, the, the left anarchists. And I think there's a lot of merits to some of their arguments. I don't necessarily view money as evil. I, I think that there might be a separation between money as a thing that's used uh, to facilitate commerce and the idea behind it or the accum problems when you have accumulation of a lot of money that is kind of uh, bonded together with power. So I, I think there's room for a lot of competing systems and I would kind of like to see that. I'm very excited about smart contracts and all of these other developments in blockchain technology. And I think we're going to see a wide variety of options become available to people who want to support a more anarcho-capitalist approach to it or even a more statist approach versus someone who's looking at more of a resource-based economy. And I'd like to see some cooperation among all of those things. I, I think it's a very exciting, uh, there's so many exciting develop, developments and with the idea of decentralization being at the forefront, you're going to naturally see these breaks in ideology anyway. I think while you could have smart wills and smart contracts without electronic money, it's easier to have them with electronic money. The idea that my will is in the system and every month someone will be paid from this address to that address seems like it should be right there with the rest of the contract. I don't see a reason for a separation. I don't know that Bitcoin is for sure the cryptocurrency of the future. It could be some new coin, but it's definitely going to be a cryptocurrency from the way I see it. Um, what do you think about the next question? What do you think about the CoinDesk article today about the Isle of Man becoming a Bitcoin hub? Uh, I'm not that familiar with the article, but it sounds like a good idea. I assume the temperatures are good there for the miners, and it's close to England for the rest of access and everything. So, um, let's see. We have a question from Tone P, who I believe is in the United Kingdom. He says, "So much apathy in the U.S." Let them walk over you. Your whole tax system is technically illegal from the instigation in the 20s and against your constitution. About time you took a stand against something, Bitcoin would be a strong start. Derek J., are we not being revolutionary enough? Uh, it's not my constitution. I don't know who this guy is really talking about, but uh, everyone in the world is free to do what they want uh, regardless of what people in fine hats say. Christoph Atlas. Well, I think the Constitution was that like really old piece of paper that they there was like these dudes they wrote some suggestions down and then uh, for a little while they were following the suggestions kind of sort of but not so much anymore. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I think the best way to opt out of the system is just to um, use cryptocurrencies and and figure out how to uh, work around the state. Um, you know, trying to put up a stand against the state is. Uh, I think pretty much a fruitless endeavor. Megan Lords. So Bitcoin is an excellent tool for a peaceful resistance kind of opting out of the tax system. I I don't really have strong opinions about the Constitution. I used to, but I, I no longer find that uh, my life is ruled by this archaic piece of paper. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to see some resistance to it. But there are going to always be people who are going to say you're not anarchist enough and you're not pure enough and all of that. Uh, so uh, while I appreciate the commenters' uh, kind of um, radicalism, uh, because I very much believe in that, you're not going to be able to please everyone. Will Pangman. Yeah, um, just to echo everybody else, uh, I know we all agree here. It's like... Um, I don't think it's wise or safe for any person. I know some people may need to do this because of the kind of system that we all live in right now. Not just in America, but the world um, is very much. This is permeated throughout the world in many places. So um, it's it, America's kind of its own, you know, petri dish of excitement. But uh, yeah, it's some Bitcoin is one great tool that allows you to live to choose to be away from this system like it's the it's the first time that we can actually have a solution that's created by all of us we can all work together remotely easily uh, without you know having to work very hard in our physical bodies we can have our computers do this hard work and you know for us and we own these machines and 
um, just maintain them, and it's going on in the periphery. You, you know, resistance in general, whether it's, it's peaceful resistance or whatever, that puts a target on your back. And I want to live a long life because I think I can do the most good and have the most effect the more years I spend with putting my hard work and time into um, making life more wonderful for me, my family, and all of my dear loved ones out there. Uh, not just the people in my geographical um, proximity, but you know the people I, I love communicating with, the people asking these questions, the people who always come on this panel on this show, projects um, that I'm working on remotely with so many great people. Uh, Bitcoin brings these great people together. It's like m wonderful in that way. You get these really smart, really uh, friendly, really love, like people full of love and life, right, that uh, work together on this stuff. And that's, that's so, what it's exciting for me. So as a tool to um, peacefully opt out and like I want to just say goodbye to the system I don't like and don't want to be a part of, and slowly but surely we're going to be able to do that more and more especially thanks to the huge leap forward, the huge floodgates that we open with um, this private money, this digital private money that we now can play with. So that's, uh, you know, I don't think getting angry, I mean, I'm, I'm, I got angry, and now I'm, not, I'm done being angry. Um, things happen and they still kind of poke at me and make me angry, but uh, anger is a stage. And um, once, you know, I hope people out there who have been angry for many, many years and they're like, it's not a stage, I'm always angry can then one, find some ways to like transcend it, get beyond it, resolve it, and, and um, put your energy towards building this thing or uh, whatever your skills can lend to making life more wonderful for you and those around you uh, with the ideas of freedom behind it. And we're going to have to do these things like somewhat rebelliously just because we're not towing the line, um, but we're not hurting anybody. We get to just opt out and live more and more of our lives in the using these tools that aren't tools given to us or granted to us or whatever, um, yeah, and, and aren't participating in the perpetual harm of people because, you know, it's, you look at paper, I look at paper money nowadays, and I know this is probably true of some of our panelists as well, but it looks to me like blood money. It looks like blood money. It looks like war dollars, you know? I know what that money does. I know how it's used now. You know, some people are just w learning how it's used and how it works, and, um, yeah, so that makes people angry. I get that. Uh, but let's get beyond the anger and let's get to building, you know, a building an all-inclusive place um, where people can come and voluntarily cooperate with each other and win-win. I would like to say, in defense of the young American people, it's very difficult to rebel against events that occur before your birth. I'm certainly against the uh, Federal Reserve Act of 1913. I'm, I'm also against the Dred Scott decision. And I would have stopped them from meeting on Jekyll Island, and I would have voted against it on Christmas Eve. And uh, more recently, I think Citizens United should be thrown out as well. So we are doing our thing over here in the colonies. We're doing the best we can. I'd like to thank Magical Rainbow Night Mage for watching at home. He says, we are all free to see a rainbow. And our last comment, I'd just like to thank this great comment from Daniel Richardson, who writes, I'd just like to add that I watched this group since episode one, and I think that with the Bitcoin channel and Mad Bitcoins, you would, without them, you'd be left out of touch of what's going on in the crypto world. Keep up the good work, and people do appreciate your efforts worldwide. Peace. A good note to end on, as we're out of time. Until next time... Bye-bye.